Welcome everyone. My name is Licha Canton and I'm the founding editor in chief of Achanti Magazine. Welcome to Achanti's Countering Isolation with Creativity, a project made possible through the financial support of Employment and Social Development Canada as part of the New Horizons Seniors Program. This is the ninth workshop in a series of 10. Welcome to Healing One Word at a Time. It's my pleasure to share the next 90 minutes with you. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking uh, to you from Jojage, unceded Indigenous lands, historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. We acknowledge them and as we write together for the next little while, uh, as we deal with some sensitive issues, let's keep in mind the first storytellers of this land. So this workshop, Healing One Word at a Time, is going to be a combination of my sharing how writing has helped me get over a difficult period in my life and a few exercises to get you to think and write uh, or jot down ideas uh, or doodle. And uh, for those of you who want to do so when the time comes, there will be some time for sharing. Uh, we're a bigger group than I had expected. So let's see how it goes. We'll take it uh, one minute at a time and uh, one word at a time. So first, uh, for those of you who don't know me, let me introduce myself. I was born in Italy. I arrived in Montreal at age four. I was raised in Montreal North where 95% of the kids in my class were of Italian origin. I'm very attached to my Italian roots, so much so that about 20 years ago, I co-founded a Chanti magazine with my husband. Um, and I'm a writer of short stories and essays, uh, so nonfiction essays, but also researched essays. My most recent projects are community-based. My most recent writing is academic. I just submitted an essay titled Queering Italo-Quebecois Literature. Um, I put together the anthology Here and Now, which introduces 35 LGBTQ plus Italian Canadian writers that came out last year. I'm the director of Creative Spaces, a documentary uh, interviews with four Montreal writers that has just become public. So a little bit later, I'll share the link in the chat. If you haven't seen it and you want to look, it's a 28 minute documentary. I'm working on a play based on a short story cycle that I published in 2018 with my favorite characters named Massimiliano and Rita. And last but certainly not least, I'm about 60 days away from my 60th birthday. I'm so excited about turning 60. Uh, and I'm looking for 60 unusual things to do that take me out of my comfort zone, but that are not too expensive. So if you have any suggestions, please feel free to put them in, in the chat at any time. Um, so now as a first exercise um, and a, a way of introducing yourself, I'd like you to take paper and pen or pencil or crayons and uh, draw the tattoo that you would get that most represents yourself. So I'll give you three, four minutes to do that. Don't worry if you don't wanna share, there'll be no time. We're not gonna take you know, uh, 35 minutes to explain the tattoos, but uh, just take about three, four minutes. And that is not my original idea. I, I, I recently, I'm in a series of workshops to help um, workshop leaders deal with mental health issues and so the workshop leader there gave us that as a an icebreaker at the first workshop so a tattoo that represents you okay so you have about three minutes i've got my phone here
Okay. So uh, hopefully you've drawn something. I'm not a, a visual artist, but uh, what I would invite you to do, and there's no obligation to do so, is take your drawing and put it in front of your camera so that I can see, or we can all see. Okay. If you don't want to do so, that's fine. Okay, some people don't want to do so. Okay, I see color. Josie, I, I see color. That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you, Josephine. Anna. Wow. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. So does anyone actually have the tattoo that they drew on them, on their bodies? No? Um, Heather? Yes? Wow, great. <laughs> I'd like to see that someday. <laughs> So how many of you would get, if you don't already have it, how many of you would get that tattoo? Okay, Maria Pia, maybe. Domenica, maybe. Ana Maiolo, maybe. Okay. All right. I don't have any tattoos. I come from a family of no tattoos ever. Um, our Lichas, sorry. Yes. My my drawing is terrible because I can't draw. <laughs> but it's a little bird that's flying over the sea. Oh okay. yes. Okay. So I understand that that yeah, that that represents you. Yes, the okay. sea and the birds. Yes. Thank you, Rosetta. Okay. So um yeah. A key question that we all have to ask ourselves. Why are we here in this workshop? Why am I here? I can tell you why I'm here. Uh, you're going to ask yourselves, or you probably already know the answer, but sometimes it's interesting to ask the question and actually write down the answer. So you'll get a chance to reflect on that a little bit later. Why am I giving this workshop? So 10 years ago, November 29th, 2012, I was hit by a car outside the Bell Center after a Leonard Cohen concert. And that's the last concert that Leonard Cohen gave in Montreal. Uh, for those of you who are not from Montreal, Bell Center is where they have the, the concerts and uh, the hockey games too, right? I'm not a hockey fan. But anyway, the big, big place where they have Celine Dion. I saw Celine Dion in concert a few years back at the Bell Center. So um, when you signed up for this workshop, with the description, there was a link to the QWF rights, where I, I have a nonfiction uh, piece that talks about the accident and writing about it. So I'm going to just read a, a short excerpt from there. In 2012, a driver pulled up behind me while I was putting a box in the trunk of my car. He crushed my legs between the two bumpers. I was bedridden for four months, and then I started physiotherapy. Within a year, I was able to do 95% of the activities that I had done before the accident. People would ask me how my legs were doing, and I would smile and tell them I was doing well. I was, physically, but I didn't tell them that I wasn't able to write. I wasn't able to write for clients. I wasn't able to organize events or attend networking functions. I didn't think any of it was worth it. I had lost my drive. In fact, I had lost my desire to do anything at all. So, you know, for, you know, people who write, say creative writing, uh, my short stories. If I weren't able to write my short stories, big deal. But my parents would say, so what if you can't write short stories, right? You don't make a living out of that anyway. But not being able to attend networking events or not being able to write for clients, that is a major disaster for my family, where two of us are contract writers. Now, all of a sudden, you've got, you know, one income not there, okay? Not just during the recovery period, but for a while longer. Uh, I remember the first time I was able to take the highway and go about 80 kilometers away and convince a new company that I had never worked for to give me a, a $70,000 contract. I came back beaming. Uh, so that was like a major thing for me. And that took about five years. So that accident, that difficult period, and the process, sorry, somebody just walked in, and the process of healing changed my perspective on life. 
It changed my writing objectives, my writing projects. Uh, it changed a lot. It changed some of my relationships, whether they were professional or personal. I did a lot of tidying up in many uh, fields, personal and professional. I was blocked and depressed. I had to write about the accident and deal with the trauma uh, because I did eventually have to acknowledge that I needed therapy. I needed to speak to a professional. So I spoke to an art therapist um, and uh, she forced me to write about the accident um, as a way of dealing with the trauma. And then she forced me to read that in public. At first I hid behind the short story genre because I write short stories, right? And then four years after the accident, I published a nonfiction piece uh, in the QWF right, uh, the one that I just read from, Healing One Story at a Time, where I say exactly what I went through. And um, something that I, I think is important is that I sent in the pitch to the QWF two years, sorry, I wrote the pitch two years before I actually sent it in. So... I knew that I wanted to share, but I wasn't ready to do so. It was only, you know, it was sitting in, and then eventually I, I clicked send. So that's another thing that we need, or I needed to acknowledge. Uh, you have to be ready to take the steps, you know, and sometimes it's really tiny steps, but you have to be ready. So um, my objective in writing the piece in saying publicly and through writing that this had happened to me, as is my objective in giving this workshop is to help others who may have similar, similar issues, who may be suffering, no matter what that suffering is, who are blocked or having difficulty dealing with or writing about a sensitive issue. So not everybody here is a writer. Uh, some people will, you know, take whatever it is that they're dealing with and create a story or a poem or uh, something else, but other people will just jot down ideas. So what I wanna say right away is that I'm not a social worker. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a healthcare uh, provider. I'm a writer who had a traumatic experience and who used writing to heal. And it took me a really long time to acknowledge that I had to deal with trauma because I come from a family where you just keep on going and you don't stop to reflect. It's very important to move forward. So um, right now we're gonna do an exercise on a piece of paper. I would like you to write your name and one, two, or three keywords that say why you are here, what you want to write about or what you need to deal with. If you are unable to put that on paper, then uh, come up with a code word. So my code is Leonard Cohen. So back when I wasn't able to say I'm depressed or I'm uh, suffering or I'm in pain or I, I can't pick up this fork to wash it, um, I would just, my code was Leonard Cohen or another code was November 29th. So um, seeing the, word Len, the words Leonard Cohen I would know what that meant, but nobody else would know what that meant, okay? So there's also an element of secrecy that, you know, sometimes we keep some of uh, our, our pain hidden, especially to those closest to us. So I can tell you, for instance, that my sister found out about the trauma when she came to one of my readings. So, and, and I know that she was very disappointed that I never shared that with her. Uh, I certainly wasn't ready ever to share it with my parents, but I did share it with my husband and my children, especially my eldest child, who is also a writer. I, I was, I had, I was cocooned and I had love around me, uh, but just my immediate family. Um, yes, so I think, so it's been 10 years. I think this is the first year that uh, when November 29th approaches, I don't feel queasy. 
So please write, write your three keywords or your code. And when you've done that, just raise your hand. When you have a code or your three keywords, raise your hand. Um, there's the, at the bottom, you have um, a, the raise hand feature. And if you don't have that, not everybody has it, just raise your hand. So I get a sense of who, who's ready. And we'll just, you know, we'll just take a few minutes. And, you know, when I see most of the hands go up, then uh, we'll move on. So it's really nice to see the hands go up one by one. Okay. Um, so no obligation, really. I want everybody to feel comfortable. Uh, but if you would like to share your your either your three key words or your code word words, um, simply do so um raise your hand again and and you know but if everybody's going at one at the same time we'll do it with the raised hand otherwise you can uh unmute and um uh, just say your words uh no main you know no major explanation just put the words out there uh and don't feel like you have to i'm not going to call on you all right so if anybody would like to do that just speak them fight for light thank you Thank you, Catherine. Expansion, alignment, compassion. Thank you, Robert. Uh, May 24th, 2020. Thank you, Carolyn. My three words are voice, mom, and hands. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, ghost. I, oh, sorry. Sorry. Ghost. Not peace ago. Heather? Ghost? Thank you, Heather. Rosetta? Uh, January 3rd, 2012, Wounded Garden. Thank you, Rose. Anna? Voice, acceptance, but I only found two. It's fine. Thank you, Anna. 
Uh, mine is September 10th, 2013. Thank you, Josie. Catherine? This uh, bond relationship peace. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Yeah. My code word is pendulum clock. Repeat, please. Pendulum, pendulum clock. Thank you, Maria Pia. I saw another hand go up quickly and then I didn't see it anymore. Dominica, Judy. Judy, then Dominica. Judy. Miguel, moon, tide. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Dominica, did you have your hand up? You need to unmute. June 20th, 2012, loss. Thank you, Dominica. Marco. My three words were basements, darkness, and uncertainty. Thank you, Marco. Uh, Licha, can I speak? Yes, yes Katerina. It's me, Katerina. I'm sorry, but I'm driving as I'm listening, so I'll participate as much as I can. I hope, but, you're, uh, I hope you're not driving. I hope you're sitting in the passenger seat. No, I'm driving, but I just stopped off on the highway now so I can speak. <laughs> okay, go ahead, okay. Katerina. Okay, my code, well, my code word would be family. Thank you. Thank okay. you for sharing. Thank you. Be careful on the highway. Oh, I, I, yeah, I am. I, I will. I will. Don't worry. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. Anna and then Marissa. Anna Romano. My three words were pain, pen, peace. Thank you, Anna. Marissa. You have to unmute, Marissa, please. Uh, freedom, peace, and acceptance. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you for sharing. Is there anyone else whose hand I may not have seen? Maria Pia, can you help me just in case I miss someone? Okay. okay. No, I don't think you miss anyone. Okay, thank you. Just so I, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce Maria Pia Spalafora, but she's actually our technical support today, but also participating in the workshop as she yeah. does every time. Okay, thank you, Maria Pia. All right, thank you everyone so much for sharing. Um, and also thank you to uh, Marissa and Anna who uh, wrote in the chat earlier. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so we are going to do an exercise to uh, stimulate the uh, creative juices or writing juices or whatever you want to call them. Okay, so pen and paper, pencil, paper, crayon, whatever, or on your computer. I like I like the pen, um, and I'm just gonna read out uh, instructions, and you just write in response to that. Okay, I'm gonna go slowly. I'm not gonna give you three minutes. I'm gonna go one by one, wait a little bit, okay? So number one, I would like you to write down two things that you like. So for instance, I like my mom's pasticcio, which is different from lasagna, it's pasticcio. And I like funny movies. Two things that you like. Anything, you know, I like the sun, I like the sea, I like birds, I like radicchio. I'm actually growing radicchio plants this year in my house. And I've had my first harvest. We've had our first salad. Last summer, I got into gardening to help me through a very stressful period. Another stressful period mm -hmm. has nothing to do with the accident. But, you know, if, you, if you've been living life long enough, you know that they're, you know, it's up and down, roller coaster. Okay, so two things that you like. Number two, 
two things that you dislike. That could be anything. Uh, could be anything, you know, like I, I dislike hypocrisy or I dislike uh, prosciutto. I don't like prosciutto, it's too salty, not good for cholesterol. Um, or, you know, I dislike, I don't know, an actor. My husband hates Julia Roberts and I like Julia Roberts. So we always have a problem if it's a Julia Roberts movie. He doesn't like, uh, uh, what's his name? Julia Roberts and the fellow that she's doing a movie with. George Clooney. Yes, George Clooney. Once, 15, 20 years ago, I said I, I thought George Clooney was really good looking. Sheesh, forget about it. Never heard the end. Still now, like, yeah, it's a good thing. Well, George Clooney, doesn't he have a house, a house in Como, near Lake Como? We should go visit sometime. Uh, okay. The next one, the color of your best friend's eyes. If you don't have a best friend, and I say that because I don't, I, I always, I haven't always had a best friend throughout my life. There have been periods with no best friend. Um, then if you don't have a best friend, then somebody that you like. I'm assuming you like your best friend, but it could also be that you don't like your best friend. So the color of that person's eyes. You might not know the color of the eyes. That's okay, just but don't know. Um, the next one, one thing that no one knows about you. So, well, people know, people who saw me growing up know, but most people professionally don't know that I used to be a butcher, that I put myself through school by working in my parents' butcher shop, that that's my backup plan in case I ever stop getting writing contracts. I've always figured I could go to some supermarket in the meat department and ask them for a job. So I'm very good with knives. <laughs> So one thing that no one knows about you. The next one, one thing that you are extremely passionate about. Lately, I've been really passionate about Radicchio. <laughs> <laughs> So one thing you're extremely passionate about. Okay, the next one. And here I will give you time. Okay, I'll give you about three minutes, then I'll check in. And then, you know, if you need more time, I'll give you another minute. What do you want to write about or deal with here? What is your hurt? What is your pain? What do you need to heal? As I said before, there's no need to share. I'm not gonna ask you to share. So feel free to write freely, just put it down, okay? Whatever, and, and then, you know, it doesn't have to be, but don't, no like full sentences, you know, just, just put it down, anything, all right? Get it out. So I'm gonna give you three minutes and then I'll check in. So see if you can write five sentences. And if you've already got, you know, 100 words, uh, or when you get to 100 words, answer the question why, if it's not already there.
How are we doing? Do you need more time? Do you want an extra minute? Show of hands if you want an extra minute. Okay, all right, I'll give you 90 seconds. Okay. All right. So maybe you've written something, maybe you haven't, maybe you're still reflecting. Uh, it's not always easy to write on something that's difficult. Uh, I knew the first story I wrote that was in this in this, the Leonard Cohen series, that's what I call it. I have six stories that come, came out of that accident. I thought I was gonna have a hundred because that was part of the process, but at six, I stopped at six. There are others that, that will come, but you know, I'm, I've moved on for, for a bit. So I knew the title of the story and I had a document with the title because of Leonard Cohen. I had that for a really long time before I ever wrote the story. So sometimes you could just have a blank document with your code word and eventually you'll write it or maybe not because it could also be that you find other ways of healing and not through writing. So just to say that uh, it, it takes the time that it takes. And, and in my case, it was with professional help. So I could just imagine if you don't, if I hadn't had professional help. Um, so I, I, you know how Facebook um, reminds you of something that happened, you know, last year, two years ago, you know, you get these reminders, your memories, that's it, memories. So just this a few days ago, no, it would have been yesterday, because December 15, 2012, this is what I wrote on Facebook, learning to walk on crutches, smiling, little steps towards recovery, what does not kill you makes you stronger literally in this case that's what they say i wonder how the man who hit me is doing is he just going about his daily routine or does he still cry when he remembers his foot slipping off the brake and onto the accelerator so one of the stories in the in the in the six in the series in the leonard Cohen series is titled the driver because although you know the accident is uh, the seed that led to this series of stories. It's not, it, it, they're fiction. I mean, I just reread some of the sections and it's, or in some cases, creative nonfiction. Uh, but in the case of the story titled The Driver, it is completely fiction, except for the beginning where, you know, I describe the man taking off with his car. So now um, I would like to ask you 
if you feel comfortable, if you've written something, if you want to read one sentence uh, and, uh, or you might participate by saying, I wrote something, but I don't wanna share it or by remaining silent. Okay, so all, all possibilities. Um, and again, we'll, we'll proceed the way we did before. Just, you know, right now there's nobody with their hand up. You could either raise your hand or you can unmute and read your sentence. And I will just thank you. There's, you know, and, and thank you, you know, thank you ahead of time for, for wanting to share. Robert. Yes. Do you want answers to just one or two of the questions or all through the gamut? No, They're no, pretty just, quick. Just, uh, just the last one where I asked you to write, well, the writing that we oh, okay. did now. Yep. Read one or two sentences that you've got down. Even if they're not complete sentences, just read yep. one or two lines. Um, in terms of what I wanted to heal the session or why am I here, there's nothing specific in terms of healing. Um, I'm evaluating trauma. I had a misunderstanding of it. I recently picked up The Myth of Normal by Dr. Gabor Mate, and he's got some interesting uh, theories with respect to trauma. And I spoke to a friend about it, and she was quite well versed, and she said, no, it's not traumatic as in the thing of, you know, say your accident, it doesn't have to be that it can be much smaller daily things in the workplace or anywhere. So looking at those small things feel truly blessed that I, you know, don't have any big traumas to deal with in my life, fingers crossed, uh, been there, done that. So today in this session, I'm not looking for anything specific, just looking for clues to expand, to get better, to be better than I was yesterday. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Josephine? Sure. My, I've got two sentences for one topic that I was thinking of. Um, the concept of God was hijacked for me by my religious upbringing. And then the why, I, I just, it, it is stunting my expression. So I'm just acknowledging that and trying to work through that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Josephine. Yes, uh, hi, Alicia. I want to write about Kate's life, my daughter Kate, her impact on me, how her death affects me, how to approach a memoir of why, to understand our relationship, motherhood, and mental illness, to find some meaning in her troubled life. Thank you, Carolyn, for sharing. Is there anyone else who would like to share? Yes, Irene. Unmute please, Irene. I'd like to share a sentence and see how that goes. Yes. The prognosis was two weeks to six months. What surprised me was how no one had seen this coming when I had always thought it possible. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Thank you for sharing. I know it's very painful. All right. When I when I uh, wrote the first story, Vera was the name of the art therapist. I love her. My husband used to say, "Oh my gosh, why don't you ask her out for coffee? You love her so much." All I talked about was about Vera. She was like the greatest person on earth, and uh, I did invite her to the launch of 
the pink house and she came. And I mentioned her, I acknowledged her. And uh, she always started off with the Kleenex box right next to me. And I went in and I read different sections. And the deal was that the day that I stopped crying, I could move on to something else. So like, that was really long for me. Because imagine you're rereading the same story and you're still crying every session you're going to. So eventually I stopped crying. Didn't need the Kleenex box. And then she gave me the bigger task of, of uh, reading it in public because that that's what I would normally do when I finish a story, I would find an audience, right? So I wasn't ready to do that. As I told you, I hadn't told like my family members that I was suffering. And um, eventually I did. I went off to Vienna to the short story conference to read it where I didn't know anybody, just a few people. So sometimes you have to go really far to find an audience that you feel comfortable with. And also, you know, even though I stopped crying in her office, I felt I needed some detachment from the story, almost like I had to be an actress to read it because then, you know, sometimes at the microphone, you might still tear up. And don't forget that I had presented this as a short story. So uh, the other thing I can share is part of the reason that I decided to say that it was based on lived experience is because a lot of people uh, who were in the audience at the different venues they would come up to me at the end and thank me for sharing the story and tell me about their story. And they knew it was just a, a short story, fiction. So I thought to myself, imagine if I had said it was a nonfiction piece, how much more of a connection there would have been. So that was also part of the motivation. So when I was seeing Vera, the art therapist, when I was unable to write, she introduced me to automatic writing or free writing, which some of you writers here uh, are probably already familiar with. What worked for me, uh, so for like weeks when she gave me this task, for weeks, all I could do was automatic writing. And I just wrote anything, whatever. Uh, so what worked for me was early in the morning when everyone was still asleep in my home. So I knew they were there. I felt cocooned, but they were sleeping. So I was sure I would not be interrupted and they wouldn't see me cry. Because part of the, the whole post-accident thing, my kids would have been, the oldest would have been 17 and the youngest would have been 10. And they didn't know what to do with me. They'd come home from school and, you know, from the entrance, they had to go up the little, uh, the few steps and they would go right by my room. I'd be in bed lying there. And I know often they would try to get by the door, which was always open. They would try to sneak by the door without stopping in or saying, the, hoping that I was asleep. Then they didn't know what to do with a mom who wasn't like active and super like organized and whatever, right? So everything like just fell apart. So uh, I felt cocooned. I knew they were in the home. They weren't, they wouldn't see me cry. And uh, the espresso coffee maker was my timer. I would set up my computer in the kitchen uh, on the blank, the open blank document and start the coffee maker and just write anything as fast as possible non-stop until the coffee gurgled and I had to stop to get up to turn off the burner that was it for the day that's what I did every day for about five weeks um, and that's how I started writing again just writing gibberish writing about anything simply doing the exercise that Vera had had given me to do so not, sometimes if you can't write, you just, you know, or doodling, you know, drawing also works. I don't know, I haven't mastered that on the computer, but I've noticed that when I'm talking, when I have a phone meeting or I'm talking to somebody, I'm drawing all these shapes. I draw triangles, you know, 3Ds, rectangles, I don't know, or flowers, you know, I'm not, I'm not somebody who draws, but I do when I'm, you know, on a, on a conversation on, a, on the phone. 
So I was supposed to write about the accident, but I couldn't. So eventually the story I wrote about was about someone who could not write about a traumatic experience. So I went sort of went around it. And the accident is only revealed at the end of the story. And because of Leonard Cohen is the title of that story. So the idea is to set a timer and just write or type shh, or doodle. It doesn't matter what it is. You can write whatever you like, however you like, just put words down. You don't worry about sentence structure, punctuation, uh, you just write. And if you can't do that, you draw. You get a pad and you draw, you doodle. Uh, and you can do that, you know, if you're dealing with something really difficult, very sensitive here, you could do that, uh, choose the five or 10 or 15 minutes of interrupt, uninterrupted time during your day. Like I said, for me, it was really in the, early in the morning before anybody got up. Uh, first thing in the morning or the last thing in the evening, and you just write anything. Okay, the idea is to keep the pen moving. And that's why, you know, even when you're drawing, doodling, you never lift the pen. You just keep going. And actually, Vera had, uh, she also had other, other exercises um, with colors. And I, I have a story called Soft Pastels that comes out of that. One day, instead of writing, I thought, let me try the colors. She's got these beautiful colors. She's, you know, could we do that? And the deal was to choose a color and never lift it off the paper until she told me to. And it was like with your eyes closed. So just, and you know, I remember that I drew a heart. I knew that in my head I had drawn a heart for all the love in my life and all the support I had through this period. But when, I, when she asked me to open my eyes, I couldn't find the heart. I knew that it was there. Um, so that, uh, and then I, I she asked me to write about that experience and I did. And I knew that if I'd come home to write it, I would never, never write it. So I wrote it in my car with, uh, at the time I describe it in the story. So the story is self-reflexive. It's about, you know, the story is about the writing of the story that you're gonna read. And uh, I had a, a, a gift bag of one of those brown gift bags and I just tore it up and I wrote it on that. And then it took me two weeks to actually put it on paper so that I could read it to her because it was only when I went to see her again and I had promised her I would come with a story. So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to do that. We're just going to, I'm going to put a timer and you're just going to write, whether it is as a follow-up or the continuation of what you started earlier uh you can doodle you can draw um you know you can take that tattoo and expand it um whatever you decide to do okay so ideally ideally you would deal with the pain or the hurt but if that you know sometimes you're writing you're doodling but you can't face that like i told you about the story i couldn't write about the accident i could write around the accident and sometimes that's the way you do it that worked for me. So I'm going to give you, uh, it's two o'clock. So I'm gonna give you uh, seven minutes, all right? Seven minutes to just keep writing on the topic that you started or anything else that you want or just gibberish. So do automatic writing if you can't, you know, if you see yourself sitting there going like this, try not to lift the paper or try to keep those, uh, the keys moving. Seven minutes.
Hi. I'm still here. Okay. All right. Okay. So as before, um, if you would like to share something, please feel free. Right now, nobody has their hand up, but if you raise your hand or if nobody else has their hand up, just unmute and maybe share a few sentences. Um, did everybody write or did someone uh, doodle or draw? Uh, did anybody draw? No, okay. Okay, so uh, would you like to share a few sentences? What was, okay, how about this? If you don't wanna share a few sentences, uh, would you like to share what, what it felt like to write about what you're writing about? Did it flow out freely? Was it difficult? Um, Robert has his hands up. Robert. Thank you, Maria Pia. Robert? Yeah, just getting unmuted. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I thought of it really, I mean, this automatic writing is in effect a brain dump. And hearing you speak of this technique was kind of a validation that's something I've stumbled on on my own, not as frantic to compress it into seven minutes, but certainly just allowing myself not to be stuck on a blank page. And, you know, your phrase about content, grammar, sentence structure. When we release and liberate ourselves from those restrictions, that's when we're stepping into our creativity. So what I wrote about that was often we procrastinate, we become intimidated by a blank page or trapped in a societally programmed delusion of perfection. Upon reflection, how absurd that quest for perfection and the miserable paralysis that it inflicts on many. Proof is found in childhood, a time when we created free range. We colored outside the lines. And it was a time when the sun could be green, the sky could be yellow, the grass was blue, and the cows were often purple. What if we went back there? What if we replaced should with could? In effect, making a frame shift from responsibility to one of possibility. What if indeed? That sounds like a true awakening to me, one that people are starving for in this digital age with its easy torrent of readily available distractions. Coming home to yourself is the true path. Your creativity is akin to your map, your compass, and your walking stick on that journey. Imagine the adventures that you may have when you move from responsibility to possibility and into your creativity. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. What color was the cow? Purple. I, I like that. And the milk would be what color? Um, Doesn't let's see. He was eating, they were eating blue grass, so blue and purple. Let's say it comes into a nice robust ruby, like a like a good glass of Chianti or something. How about that? Imagine a cow that gave Chianti for milk. How, how great would that be? <laughs> the kids would be drunk in kindergarten. Well, they'd have different cows. The, the purple cows would be the adult ones. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Welcome. It's good. It's good to laugh. You know, during that period, I remember like just choosing movies just just because they were funny and silly. And I didn't think have to think about anything. So laughter also works. Um, would anyone else like to share? Yes, Josephine, go ahead. Sure. Um, I've got it. I covered a few different topics, but I'll, I'll just cover a particular short paragraph. Um, Kurds, the Kurdish people, I relate to them so much. It's almost like I was a Kurd in a previous life. Their fight for self-determination is a fight I have fought my whole life, or most of it. 
their language, their culture, all these are markers in indicators of meaning. And then what are my indicators was the next question. And then you call time. So I've, I've been thinking about that. I hope you continue that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, continue that on your own. If we have time, I'll give more time to continue writing. But yeah, that, I, I take, I've taken a number of workshops. Um, and I, I know that sometimes like during the workshop, I'm actually focused and writing and, and then I might not go back to it. I might go back to it, you know, in two months and I'm like, oh, wow, what could I do with that? You know, can I continue? Uh, can I actually wrap it up or polish it? Yeah. So the idea would be that you would also continue later on after the workshop. Thank you for sharing, Josephine. Um, Ita, just to remind you, you have 50 minutes left. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maria Pia. It's very kind. Okay, so we did start five minutes later. So uh, I'll take a few more minutes to, um, if anybody else would like to share, please feel free, but don't feel obliged. My family hates that sound. Uh, <laughs> time to go. Um, anybody else? Was I'll it? Try to, I'll try to say something. Yes, Solange. Yes, hi, Solange. I'm going to try because um, I feel very emotional because I hear you talking about your therapist that was so great. And, and me, it's the opposite. <laughs> so uh, my, my problem is that I went in a therapy and the psychoanalysis that was extremely destructive and I'm stuck there um, because there was no recognition from uh, her corporation, L'Ordre Psychologue and the Canadian Psychoanalytical Society. So they put not only the blame on the patient, that is the sick one, but uh, they abandoned me in that. Like when you go into psychoanalysis, you regress, you know? And because I was destructed, mentally destructed by her incompetence, um, they abandoned me. So I have difficulties climbing back up. Thank you. Thank you, Solange. Thank you for sharing. So the other thing about a workshop like this is that we hear other people's pain. And I'm not saying that that helps us with our individual pain, but there, there's a community building, right? So, okay. Does anyone want to share uh, how they felt about writing, Josie? Yes. Go ahead. Um, Alicia, this is the first time I tried automatic writing. So I just uh, wanted to share what I did. And yes. basically I uh, uh, you know, recapped what I was thinking before, but I will read the, the last part. So what I wrote was just automatically like this. Forgive me if there are any mistakes. Um, after writing my previous painful story down, I have suddenly realized that my focus has shifted dramatically. My first dramatic experience was about a member of my family, but now I realize that the dramatic self is my own. This is not easy to accept. As in all the events of my life, I can always explore the other's feelings, not mine. I can always look through the other souls, not mine. And finally, I can always admit the other's greatness, not mine. That's what I wrote. Thank you, Josie, for sharing. Thank you. That was in two minutes when you said automatically. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone want to share how they felt about what they wrote? without sharing what they wrote? Marissa? Um, and then Heather. Marissa? I, I find that in general, uh, writing is a form of therapy, um, whether it's to um, express 
uh, positive emotions or, or you know, or, um, write down negative situations, right? It always helps you to, to um, get a hold of, of whatever it is. Sometimes you have to do it more than once, um, you know, um, but writing is, is just, it could make you feel good and, and it, could, it could help you some, give some relief. It won't cure nor change your situation, um, but it definitely has an impact in terms of, um, um, you know, how you feel about it, right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Welcome. Heather? Yeah, I was just going to say about the process. I liked not having to think about the punctuation and all that. It, it was easier to get my thoughts out um, without having to analyze it that much. So I like that part about it. But it did cross my mind when I was doing it when you said you had to do that every day. Like, I don't know if I'd have enough to, to do that all the time, you know, but it was today was the first time I do it. And it was nice and easy without thinking about all the rules. Mm. Yes, no rules. That's good. <laughs> Anna? Unmute, please. Yeah. Um, just to add to that, uh, I'm, I'm not going to share what I wrote, but I, I do do that kind of journal writing. Uh, I've done it in the past, but and sometimes it's gibberish. And sometimes, like I think it was Marissa that just said, it makes you uh, self-reflect. It makes you think about what it is that's really bothering you it is a kind of therapy um but what i do is i kind of look at the what i've written like what i just wrote and i just circle what the words that i think are important you know like pain or sadness or childhood unconditional love just the words and then from there i'll do like another little exercise and try to create a little paragraph with just those words that i have circled and then that turns out to be better, you know, for me. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Yes, Catherine. Um, yes, I found it really interesting because I find that it helped me to take a step back from sort of an intense situation where I'm right in the storm and it's intense, whereas it helped me to just write automatically helped me to pull back and see some elements that I wasn't necessarily seeing. And although the situations may be difficult, it sort of brought out certain positive elements that I wasn't seeing calming. So I, I enjoyed it. Thank you, Catherine. Anyone else would like to share? Marco, is that your hand up or? No, I, I, I didn't have it, it up, but I'll just say, uh, I, I like the auto writing. So I'm glad you pr uh, prompted us to do that. And then in this case, I, I had a different thought from a previous piece that I'm trying to work through. And so without looking at that, I just, you know, almost started from scratch to, you know, write uh, for the, those seven minutes. So then I could compare this piece with, you know, what I wrote you know, months ago. So yeah, the, the prompt was helpful. So thank you. And, and I appreciate hearing from everyone else um, and what they've been uh, uh, writing about and processing. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank there you. is a message on the, on the chat Yes. Uh, from Josephine Shortino. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you want to read it, Maria Pia, please? Yes. I felt safe to write it out. I've been scared to write it out and to take the time to write. I wasn't scared at this time. Taking the time and giving my thoughts the space. This was very helpful. Thank you, Josephine. Thank you, Josephine. Um, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. You know, sometimes being in a group, even though you were each of us doing our own thing, dealing with our own thing, but you know that there are other people there, sort of like I felt cocooned, you know, with my family sleeping, but I could deal with my pain because I knew that they were there. Uh, I wasn't completely alone. So this, the workshop is in a way is like that. You're not, you're alone in your, wherever you are, in your home or in your office, but you're not. 
Um, so that sometimes helps. Um, okay, so I'm looking at the time. Um, let me just uh, look at my notes here. I think, remember before I talked about the timing and being ready to do something. So as I explained to you uh, with the, the, the pitch that I sent to the, the Quebec Writers Federation, sometimes it's a, it's a, a question of the right moment. Uh, sometimes you need to let some time go by. And the other way around too, sometimes I, I felt that if I let too much time go by, I move on to something else, but I haven't dealt with that. And it'll resurface in one way or another. So I know that it'll, I'll have to deal with it. And then since I write short stories, sometimes some of those difficult issues resurface through a character. I find myself putting a character in a situation that I haven't dealt with, you know, in real life and sort of working that out through that character. Uh, and that's a different way of doing it. I don't know if it's always, well, it's definitely useful for me. I don't know if it's, it's complete healing because I've noticed that that will resurface again. So I can tell you that recently, well, recently, last year, uh, I really, you know, in my childhood, I dealt with somebody in my family that was, let's call him an abuser. It wasn't somebody that I, that I really had to see, but came across in different, you know, functions. And I had, I found out then last year that this person died. Somebody told me, oh, you know, so-and-so died, you know, and I said, I couldn't even, and this person was related to him. I couldn't get myself to express my sympathies because of the pain he had caused to my family. And I, and I thought, I need to deal with that. How do you deal with someone who hurt you or your loved ones and now you know his family is suffering because he's died but I have no compassion for that you know I mean I, I feel sad for the people who are sad but it's like he didn't die soon enough and I'm not that kind of person where I would say he didn't die soon somebody should have killed him right that's not me but I, I am aware, and that was something new, how to deal with sort of postponed pain or consequences of pain, something from a long time ago, from decades ago, that when you find out that, you know, I don't know, let's just say an ex-spouse died, how, how do you deal with that? I mean, I guess if you have kids with the ex-spouse, well, that's different because you're going through your kids and your kids are sad because they've lost a, a, a parent. But if it's an ex-spouse, I have an ex-spouse. I should say that. And I'm thinking, if I find out that he died, and this is somebody from 40 years ago, that gives you an idea of how young I was when I got married. How am I going to feel? He's not part of my life. I don't know where he is. But there's pain there, right? So, but then I know that when I find out that he's died, I'll have to deal with, you know, all, all this bubbling, all this stuff will bubble up again. Um, anyway. Okay, so, um, so I have like a series of tips. Uh, they might not all apply, but one of them is what, uh, write what you need to write about. It'll resurface. So, you know, maybe this would be for other workshops, but uh, generally speaking, I leave uh, workshop participants with write what you know, write what you're passionate about, write what you need to write about. So this would be especially pertinent for this workshop and failing that, use automatic writing to help you. Um, yeah, some of the prompts that I can leave you with um, 
if ever you wanted to do exercises on your own. Um, and here you, there are no rules. We talked about rules before. It could be, you could write a poem, you could write a short story. I've always been afraid of poetry. Even as a student, I was afraid of poetry. Like as a, a literature major, you know, we had to take poetry classes and I was like, oh, the last class I would take like in the last session, it's like, oh, and I'm gonna fail for sure. I don't understand poetry. But sometimes whatever I need to express comes out in a poem and it comes out in dialect or in Italian or in French, never in English. So, um, or write a short story or beginnings of a short story, a personal essay, a review, that's helpful sometimes to, you know, you saw a movie that was really bad. How about you write a review, even if it goes nowhere, tell people, save your money. Um, and with this exercise, you would start aim for a hundred words and I'm sure you'll get to a thousand in no time, okay? Uh, so some of these prompts that you could consider for whenever you want to do something on your own, write a letter to your past self, the self that went through the loss or the trauma from your today self, from your today self. What would you say to comfort your past self? What advice would you give? So in my case, you know, that young bride who ran away, what could I say to that person who thought her life, you know, she'd never have a, a happy life? Write about the event in the third person as though it happened to someone else. Change the location or change the gender of the someone that you're writing about. Uh, after you've described the event and its effects on the person, Read your story out loud to see how you feel. How does reading and hearing about the event as though it happened to someone else change how you feel? And a third point, if you've suffered as a result of someone else's actions, write about the event from his or her perspective. What was his or her background or their background? What was going on in their life at the time? So this is what I did for the story, The Driver. I wrote about the driver who hit me. I don't know if any of you, well, not of, all of you are from Jojage, but uh, Montreal. But um, recently I went to see a play at Centaur, uh, English Language Theater, Montreal. And it was about the Me Too movement and the, the, the young woman wrote about it through the man's perspective. And the play we are watching is what she offers to him at the end, the manuscript that will be published soon. I thought that was really interesting. So it's about, you know, creating some distance from the pain. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to are there any questions that I could answer? I might not have an answer, but I might lead you to a spot where you might find an answer. Um, I am going to put in the chat. Actually, Maria Pia, can you do that uh, quickly? Can you find the link uh, to the documentary on the Achenti? YouTube sure, sure. Chat. Um, and I will find something else to put in the chat for you. So those of you who are writers or enjoy writing or who are other artists, uh, one thing that I'm working on that was just, uh, that was just publicized a little while ago is the Achenti Festival. The, the first Achenti Festival of the Arts, as I mentioned before, like uh, it, it's it's 20 years since we started Achenti Magazine and we are celebrating by organizing a Festival of the Arts in Italy, which will take place uh, June 28th to July 1st, 2023. So if you know anyone who is in the arts and this will combine creative creators uh, and academics. So there'll be, you know, papers, uh, but also roundtable discussions and people presenting their creative work. Um, 
yeah if there are, are there any questions um and I'll, i will be wrapping up soon i have a sort of an official close leech of the editor-in-chief of achenti has to close officially <laughs> and thank leech of the workshop leader <laughs> any questions you could always write to me at lcanton at achenti.ca uh, you will be receiving a survey from Achenti Magazine to give feedback on this workshop so that I, as a workshop leader, and I, as an editor of the magazine, can improve the workshops that we offer. Uh, we did apply for funds from the same funding agency to do another series of workshops in 2023-2024, so we're waiting to hear back on that. So if you give feedback on this workshop or any other workshop that you've attended, that'll help me and the team here, mostly Dominic, my, my colleague, um, to, to come up with the right kind of workshop. Okay. All right, so I will close. Thank you all for being here at Achenti's Countering Isolation with Creativity, a project made possible through the financial support of Employment and Social Development Canada as part of the New Horizons Seniors Program. Uh, you can go to the link and we have one more workshop. I don't have a date. And that will be uh, Dominic Cusmano, the publisher of Achenti, is the last uh, is giving the last workshop. He hasn't chosen a date yet, but hopefully it'll be soon. And his workshop is on uh, editing and preparing uh, a text for publication. So that would be interesting from a publisher's point of view, which is different from an editor's point of view, actually. And I can tell you that because we have many, many, many debates. <laughs> All right, so it was wonderful to see you on, on the screen, and uh, I, I hope you come to the next workshop. I hope I'll have an opportunity to meet you in person in the near future. Um, you, you know, whatever you're dealing with, I the time, I always think back to the time where I couldn't even pick up a fork, fork to wash it, and I look at how far I've come. I'm giving workshops now on Zoom. So, you know, if I could do it, whatever it is you're dealing with, don't give up and reach out. <laughs>